It is in our nature to overanalyze, to go beyond the boundaries of our rationality and let our imagination fill in the blanks. What is more perverse than our tendency to overanalyze, however, is our inability to recognize when we are doing it. Sometimes we become so determined to understand something so complex that we will submit to the irrational side of our nature and let it guide our perception. It's completely natural to do this because if some people don't submit to their irrational side, Side, their inability to explain that complex thing can lead to feelings of anxiety and helplessness. For instance, when one encounters an act of human evil that is so brutal and unrelenting, it can defy your comprehension. In the worst cases, they might result in something like post-traumatic stress disorder, where you encounter something so traumatizing that your brain can't process it. Even if, somehow, somebody is able to avoid such an affliction, that confusion and horror you experience experienced will nevertheless sit in your memory for the rest of your life. Director Stanley Kubrick recognized this human tendency to submit to irrationality and anxiety when rational explanations no longer suffice. He exploited this tendency to the fullest extent in many of his films, and arguably did so best with his horror masterpiece, The Shining. While the film is fascinating and horrifying in and of itself, what is arguably as, if not more, fascinating are the interpretations of the film. If you read interpretations online, in academic literature, or you watched the Room 237 documentary entirely dedicated to interpretations of The Shining, you will witness the human tendency to switch from rational and logical to irrational and desperate very quickly. The only problem is, you're not initially sure when that's which happens. For this video, I do not intend to praise or disparage the various interpretations of The Shining that have been made. Rather, I will audaciously dance on the border between the rational and irrational by offering my own interpretation. I will present some of the pre-existing interpretations that I believe have the most merit and mold them together into a new and original take. Now, I hesitate to claim my interpretation as new or original, especially when talking about a 40-year-old film that has been analyzed by people far more brilliant than myself. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find somebody who has offered a theory similar to mine, even though some of the proofs I will offer as a part of my theory were made by others. Citations will be provided on screen and in the description box below. Needless to say, there are spoilers ahead. As the title of this video suggests, I intend to center my theory around a book situated on Stuart Ullman's desk, a red book that is literally titled The Red Book. While such a thing might seem innocuous at first, any Kubrick fan knows that minor details in his films can range from irrelevant to significant. I treat this red book as one of the latter. A while ago on Twitter, one of my viewers, whose name I regrettably have forgotten, pointed out that this book laid on Ullman's desk. And I nearly fell out of my chair in shock. Why? Well, one of the subjects I frequently discuss on my channel is psychology, specifically the theories of Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung. One of his most famous works is titled The Red Book. Anybody who is a fan of the movie and knows what The Red Book is would understand why I nearly fell out of my chair. It's because it might help explain the horrors of The Shining. But before I explain what The Red Book is, a little bit of history. Between the years 1913 and 1917, the contents of the Red Book were produced. For nearly a century, the book remained unpublished all the way up until October 7th, 2009. While there were various reasons that the book remained unpublished, the primary reason centered around a belief that the world was not ready for its contents. This makes sense, because that period of Jung's life has been described as one of creative illness, a psychotic break, or simply madness. However, there are people that contradict this assessment, pointing out that Jung still managed to be a writer, lecturer, psychologist, and an officer in the Swiss Army during this time. So. What baffling contents were contained in this book that led to such divided opinion? Well, in the simplest terms, Jung was attempting to confront the products of his unconscious mind. If you don't understand what that means, think of it this way. For two-thirds of our lives, we are in a conscious state, going about our daily activities. For the other third, we are in an unconscious state, sleeping and dreaming. What many people are unaware of is a third state, 
called a hypnagogic state. Think of this state as the borderline between consciousness and unconsciousness, between being awake and sleeping. When one is in a hypnagogic state, one might experience hallucinations. What one might normally see in one's dreams begins to bleed into your conscious state. Between 1913 and 1917, Jung deliberately provoked hypnagogic states and recorded them in the Red Book. According to Jung, much of his psychoanalytic theory stemmed from this point in his life, from the images produced by his unconscious mind. One thing I'd like to point out before returning to The Shining is that while the book remained unpublished until 2009, there were a select number of people that were able to see it and summarize its contents. For those who didn't see it, the existence of the Red Book was nonetheless established. It was a sort of holy grail of psychology that was discussed for decades, not just among academics, but amongst the public. What did it contain? When would it be released? Regardless if Kubrick was one of the few people to read the Red Book, or if this is just a prop created for the film, it has been well established that Kubrick was influenced by psychoanalysis and by Jung's theories more specifically. For example, back in 2000, Vanity Fair conducted an interview with a man named Michael Hare. He was the co-writer for Kubrick's follow-up film to The Shining, Full Metal Jacket. He recounted a phone call he had with Kubrick around 1980 when The Shining was about to be released in theaters. Quote, He called me a couple of nights later to ask if I'd read any Jung. I had. Was I familiar with the concept of the shadow, our hidden dark side? I assured him that I was. We did half an hour on the shadow and how we really wanted to get it into his war picture. If Kubrick was sufficiently influenced by Jung to base an entire film around one of his concepts, I think it seems reasonable to assume that Jung's theories had at least some influence on The Shining. Allow me to begin the construction of my theory by citing an interview Stanley Kubrick did with a man named Michel Simon. When Kubrick was asked about his thoughts on Stephen King's novel, which the film was based on, Kubrick said the following, quote, I thought it was one of the most ingenious and exciting stories of the genre I had read. It seemed to strike an extraordinary balance between the psychological and the supernatural in such a way as to lead you to think that the supernatural would eventually be explained by the psychological. I ask that you read that final sentence again, for it is a major component of my overall theory. Much like Jung, whose entire life's work centered around proving a symbiotic connection between psychology and the supernatural, it seems apparent to me that Kubrick was attempting to do the same with The Shining. Let's take a step back from this for a few minutes so we can avoid some confusion. Let's examine one of the more credible theories surrounding the film's narrative. One detail about the movie that was not present in the book was that the Overlook Hotel was situated on an ancient Native American burial ground. The theory states that because the hotel was built on sacred ground, on the bodies of natives who succumbed to European disease and war, there are supernatural forces and spirits seeking revenge for this injustice from beyond the grave. There are multiple events and symbols in this movie that back up this interpretation. For example, another thing that was in the movie that wasn't in the book was the river of blood emerging from the elevator. Whose blood could this belong to except the roughly 20 million natives who died following the arrival of the Europeans, which amounted to 95% of the Native American population? To further confirm that this blood is in fact the blood of the Native Americans, the YouTube channel called Collative Learning pointed out this hint in the aforementioned Full Metal Jacket. When the main character is being interviewed later on in the film, we see a display for a movie behind him. If you translate the name of the movie from Vietnamese to English, you find that the movie is the 1948 John Wayne movie named Red River. In that movie, there are several clashes between John Wayne and the quote-unquote Indian population. Another thing that Collative Learning pointed out in his video about Native American themes in The Shining is that there is a painting on the wall outside of Stuart Ullman's office, done by a Native American artist named Norval Morisseau. This painting has a name, but before I tell you what the name of it is, I ask my fellow Jungians to plant yourself firmly in your chair, just just in case you might fall out of it. The name of this painting is Great Mother. For anybody that knows anything about Jungian psychology, you will know that the Great Mother is one of the famous archetypes discussed by Jung throughout his works. Moreover, one of Jung's students, Eric Neumann, wrote an entire book on this archetype literally titled The Great Mother. While I found out through collative learning that the name of this painting was The Great Mother, I've yet to find anybody making the connection between the painting and Jung's concept of archetype. If somebody has made that connection, please let me know in the comments. 
I am about to state my theory in full, but before I do, let us review what we have discussed so far. First, I think it is safe to say that Kubrick was inspired by Jungian psychology, specifically his experiences and theories regarding the unconscious mind. Second, I think he used Native American themes as a way of expressing Jung's concepts. Third, Kubrick himself said that The Shining strikes a balance between supernatural and psychological so that the latter might explain the former. Now, what does this all amount to? I theorize that the Overlook Hotel is an external representation of the internal unconscious mind. Like I said about the three states of consciousness, conscious, unconscious, and hypnagogic, I think the hotel acts as an external, real-world version of the hypnagogic state, a portal between the objective real world and the subjective supernatural world. It is a place where the supernatural contents of one's personal unconscious and humanity's collective unconscious bleed, sometimes literally, from the supernatural unconscious realm into the natural conscious world. If that's too confusing for you, don't worry, I'll do my best to give some clear examples. I'll start with this. There is a video game series called Silent Hill. Depending on which game in the series you play, the main character confronts the products of either their unconscious mind or somebody else's in the town of Silent Hill. The products of their unconscious mind take the form of monsters. I think it's appropriate to compare the whole town of Silent Hill to the Overlook Hotel. It is a place where psychic contents come alive. I am certain that I am not the only one to see this connection, as the creators of Silent Hill have openly cited The Shining as an inspiration, going so far as to put references to the movie in the first two games. To further support my theory, I will cite the scene where Dick Halloran is talking to Danny Torrance about what The Shining is, as well as the nature of the Overlook Hotel. You know, some places are like people. Some shine and some don't. I guess you could say the Overlook Hotel here has something about it that's like shining. When Halloran says that the Overlook Hotel can be like a person, I think he's talking about the unconscious. In Halloran's mind, the hotel has an unconscious like a person does. In order to further explain what I mean and what Halloran means, it's necessary to explain another Jungian concept, one I just referenced, called the collective unconscious. Here's a definition, quote, Jung's theory on the collective unconscious was that it is made up of a collection of knowledge and imagery that every person is born with and is shared by all human beings due to ancestral experience. Although individuals do not know what thoughts and images are in their collective unconscious, it is thought that in moments of crisis, the psyche can tap into the collective unconscious. As for what is in the collective unconscious, Jung believed that it is made up of instincts and archetypes that manifest basic and fundamental pre-existing images, symbols, or forms which are repressed by the conscious mind. If you are having trouble understanding this, think of it this way. When you are a baby, how do you know how to breastfeed? Moreover, how do you know how to breastfeed from your mother? Well, your brain is constructed in a way so that when you are born, you instinctually do that. The baby recognizes the universal pattern or archetype of the mother, and they inherit the instinct of breastfeeding. The collective unconscious, according to Jung, is this intangible universal force that every human being is born from, and from the collective unconscious, we inherit these collective instincts and archetypes. Now, in regards to what shining is, I think it takes the concept of the collective unconscious and takes it literally. While it is about the images symbols, and forms we inherit, it can also be about sharing an unconscious link. When Halloran and Danny shine to each other, it is because they are in tune with the collective unconscious, the force that binds all humans. Through this, they are linking their unconscious minds together. It is because both Halloran and Danny have such strong psychic power that they can form a connection in the collective unconscious and communicate telepathically. Now, let's get back to my belief that the Overlook has an unconscious. I'll let Halloran set up my theory once again. You know, Doc, when something happens, it can leave a trace of itself behind. Say, like, if someone burns toast, well, Maybe things that happen leave other kind of traces behind. Not things that anyone can notice, but things that people who shine can see. Just like they can see things that haven't happened yet. Well, 
Sometimes they can see things that happened a long time ago. I think a lot of things happened right here in this particular hotel over the years. And not all of them was good. What this tells me is that with the deaths of the natives, the Overlook Hotel being built on top of it, and many sinful injustices being committed inside the hotel, like the killing of Delbert Grady's children, this left enough psychic energy behind in the Overlook for it to develop its own type of unconscious mind. If you've ever thought about where the concept of a haunted house came from, this is where. Because so many evil acts were committed here, the hotel has built up so much negative psychic energy that it has taken on a life of its own. When the Overlook shines to people, it has its own unconscious force trying to lure in people via their own unconscious so it may corrupt them. One way it does this is with disturbing images of great evil. Images familiar to many people like the spilling of blood, skeletons, or bodily decay. Images we hold in our collective unconscious. Unconscious. Another way it does this is by activating elements of their personal unconscious, like with Danny's imaginary friend, Tony, or with Jack's ancestral history, which we shall discuss more in a moment. The Overlook is trying to make a connection much like how Halloran and Danny do. However, this luring isn't unique to people who shine. It can lure in people whose unconscious minds are taking over their entire being. People who become hysterical, like Wendy, and see things. Or people like Jack, who have so much darkness in their hearts that they are lured in to do the hotel's vengeful bidding. This is all but confirmed by this quote from Kubrick. Jack comes to the hotel psychologically prepared to do its murderous bidding. He is bitter about his failure as a writer. He is married to a woman for whom he has only contempt. He hates his son. In the hotel, at the mercy of its powerful evil, he is quickly ready to fulfill its dark role. The Overlook makes use of the vengeful spirits that inhabit it, so those spirits can find revenge from beyond the grave. There are many other aspects of the film that back up my assertion that the hotel has an unconscious mind. Let me ask you this. When you are asleep and your unconscious mind takes over, what do you see in your dreams? Do you often see things like monsters? Do you somehow find yourself in places that shouldn't logically be there? Will you dream that you are at one moment inside your house and then suddenly you're at a party? Yet during all of this, you don't ever think to yourself that what you're seeing isn't real, for the most part. There are other aspects of the hotel that have the same illogical inconsistencies when one is dreaming. As pointed out by Collative Learning in his spatial awareness videos, he demonstrates that the architectural layout of the overlook hotel doesn't make sense. For example, there is a window in Ullman's office that has sun shining through it. However, given the placement of Ullman's office, that window should not exist. Yet everybody at the hotel thinks the placement makes sense. Just like we treat the products of our unconscious mind in our dreams as logical. Like I just said, there are other elements of The Shining that support my theory, but I don't want to oversaturate an already complicated video. I'll save those for another time. I want to conclude on what is arguably the greatest mystery of The Shining. Why is Jack in that picture at the end of the movie? Well, I'll give you the short story first before I give you the long version. In the aforementioned interview with Michel Simon, Kubrick states that the photo of Jack suggests he is reincarnated. This makes sense because earlier on in the film, we hear Jack say that upon entering the hotel, it was like he had been there before. In regards to how this connects to my theory about the collective unconscious, let us go back to the definition I cited before. What does it say? Jung's theory on the collective unconscious was that it is made up of a collection of knowledge and imagery that every person is born with and is shared by all human beings due to ancestral experience. Ancestral experience? You mean like the people we descended from? If science accepts that we inherit certain biological traits from our ancestors, why not accept as Jung does that human beings inherit certain psychic factors from our ancestors? Maybe the memories of our ancestors repressed deep down inside of our unconscious minds. Many people have theorized that The Shining is about the never-ending cycle of violence throughout history. For example, Stuart Ullman said that the previous caretaker, Charles Grady, killed his wife and two daughters with an axe back in 1970. Charles Grady's ancestor, Delbert Grady, heavily implies to Jack that he killed his wife and twin daughters back in the 1920s. If Jack Torrance attempted to kill Wendy and Danny in 1980, maybe his ancestor attempted something similar several decades before. This begs another question. How long has this cycle been going on? In my opinion, 
I think the film suggests that the cycle of violence has been going on since the beginning of time. My evidence for this goes back to the painting of the Great Mother we discussed before. The Great Mother is an archetype of Jungian psychology. An archetype is a universal pattern to human existence or existence itself. It has determined the forms of our universe since its inception. In regards to the Great Mother, it embodies all of the feminine patterns and traits of existence, be they positive or negative. Prior to our recent scientific times, these archetypes were symbolized as gods. If one were to represent the good traits of the Great Mother, it might take the form of something like the Egyptian goddess Isis. If one were to represent the bad traits, it might take the form of something like the Hindu goddess Kali. If one were to represent the Great Mother for all its good and bad traits, it might be something like Marceau's painting. In Jung's mind, the archetypes inhabit the unconscious. They direct our behavior. They establish the patterns that shape who we are. In The Shining, the unconscious mind within the Overlook houses archetypes, much like our unconscious minds. Kubrick even states as much in his interview with Michel Simon. The reason why he chose that photo is because, quote, every face around Jack is an archetype archetype of the period. No wonder the spirits of the Overlook's unconscious mind take the form of these quote-unquote archetypes. In regards to The Shining, it seems that the spirits, archetypes, whatever of the Overlook Hotel are luring in evil people who harbor the worst patterns of human existence, so that they can continuously commit the same pattern of violence, the worst possible atrocities, again and again and again. For Jack Torrance, he represents all the worst traits of the archetypal Great Father. After a while, he becomes possessed by these negative archetypal traits. His unconscious mind takes over his entire being and he loses any sense of morality. He is no longer Jack. He is controlled by the negative archetypes. He is his ancestors, bleeding over from the unconscious or supernatural world into the conscious, material world. As long as the injustices committed in or around the Overlook Hotel remain unresolved, the unconscious evil mind in the Overlook Hotel will psychically connect with other unconscious evil minds, perpetuating this never-ending cycle. Though Kubrick has stated that Jack was reincarnated, others have theorized that the picture suggests that Jack was absorbed back into the hotel. If the Overlook is perpetuating a never-ending cycle of violence, a pattern inherent to human existence, maybe it's possible that Jack reincarnated but upon death, he was absorbed back into the hotel, waiting to begin the murderous cycle again through somebody else. As for who that person might be, maybe it's Danny Torrance. Like his father, he develops a drinking problem. He struggles with an inner darkness, the post-traumatic stress brought about by the Overlook. Will he break the cycle? Will he not? I suppose we'll find out when Dr. Sleep releases on November the 8th. Special thanks to English and That What You Did Not Expect from my Discord server, as well as Mr. Beto and Gaming University. These four helped edit my script. Thank you all so much for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a like. That really helps out my channel. If you were sufficiently spooked by this video, make sure to share it around. If you want to support my channel financially, I have a subscribe star link down below filled with various reward tiers that I think you would appreciate. Finally, make sure to subscribe because I have some more horror-related content coming out in the month of October. Cheers.